welcome to this video and this video is another Alphabet Mafia questions answered video and your question for today is how many rights do we have as a member of the LGBTQ plus community? Let's go! Now as I was doing my research for this video um, it came up a lot of things to do with either being gay, lesbian or bisexual rights. It had nothing to do with transgender rights. So I did a little bit of digging of that, um, but first we will. We'll go through some of the history of what our rights were, because um, they have progressed over time. And this is all to do with the UK as well. So the website that we are going to read from right now is called LGBTQ History. So basically it's a short overview of the rights in the UK. This article traces the journey of the LGBT community from 1533 till today. Now, I'm not entirely sure when this article was written, so it might be a good few years ago. That means today, so it's not the it's not 2021 that it means so let's jump straight into it the buggery act of 1533 passed by parliament during the reign of henry the eighth is the first time in law that male homosexuality was targeted for prosecution in the uk um completely outlawed suddenly in britain by and by extension what would become the entire British Empire, convictions were punishable, punishable by death. So in 1533, you could be put to death for being gay as a man, because they said nothing about women. That just states that if you're gay, if you're a gay male, you could be put to death, basically. It was not until 1861, with the passing of the Offences Against the Person Act, that the death penalty was abolished for acts of sodomy, instead being made punishable by a minimum of 10 years and punished in imprisonment. In 1861 death penalty was abolished so you couldn't be put to death for being gay. Instead they put in place a minimum of 10 years in prison for being gay. Again this literally just states that for a gay, a gay male um, but I'm gonna assume that if you identify as gay and or you're with the same sex then that counts but this article literally just states male. The, crim the Criminal Law Amendment Act 1885 however went a step further once again making any male homosexuality act illegal whether or not a witness was present meaning that even acts committed in private could be prosecuted often a letter expressed in terms of affection between two men was all that was required to bring a prosecution the legislation was so ambiguously worded that it became known as the blackmailers charter and in 1895 oscar wilde fell victim in 1885 any type of affection Again, it just states between two males, so by the looks of it, at that point, lesbians didn't exist. Or anyone didn't exist unless you're a male, unless you're a gay male. But basically, that at that time, um, if you showed any affection towards your significant other, even in private, that could basically send you to prison if they suspected you of that. So female homosexuality was never explicitly targeted by any legislation so there we go at first it was just all male although discussed for the first time in parliament in 1921 with a view of introducing discriminatory legislation to become a criminal law amendment bill in 1921 this ultimately failed with both the house of commons and the house of lords rejected it rejected rejected it due to fear a law would draw attention and encourage women to explore homosexuality. It was also assumed that lesbianism occurred in an extremely small pocket of the female population. So th that bill never got passed because they thought that if they made that the law then more women would explore their sexuality. I, d I don't think people... What if the law states that it is a crime for me to love another woman? I ain't gonna explore that at that time. If it's the minimum of 10 years in prison. That's fucked up. In the post-war period, transgender identity started to become visible. So we're getting more into the transgender, that's good. In 1946, Michael Dillon published Self, a study in endocrinology, the book which in con contemporary terms could be described as an autobiography of the first transgender man to undergo palo... Paloplasmy? 
surgery. I'll put it on the screen. I have no idea how to pronounce that. Hopefully you do. We counted Dylan's journey from Laura to Michael and the surgeries undertaken in pi by pioneering surgeon Sir Harold Gillies. Dylan wrote, where the mind cannot be made to fit the body, the body should be made to fit approximately at any rate to the mind. So that happened in 1946. So they transitioned from female into male um, and essentially wrote an autobiography about it. In May 1951, Roberta Cowell, a former World War II Spitfire pilot, became the first transgender woman to undergo vaginoplasty surgery in the UK. Cowell continued her career as a racing driver and published her autobiography in 1954. So that's quite cool. And we'll go a little bit more further into uh, the details about the actual law and the laws that transgender people actually have here in the UK. Uh, but this is just a brief history of the, some of the some of the rights and some of the people that happen to be the first transgender male and the first transgender woman. Meanwhile, a significant rise in arrests and prosecutions of homosexual men were made after World War II. Many were from high rank and held positions within government and national institutions, such as Alan Turing. If you don't know who Alan Turing is, please, please, please go look it up. If it wasn't for him decoding, uh, decoding the Enigma code, so if he didn't do that, our war, uh, World War II would be a lot longer than it actually was and he just so happened to be gay and there's also a book there's, there's also a book about him and there's also been a film a film made about him um, so i highly suggest you read the book it's a it's a hefty book to read though um and also watch the film if you don't want to read the book uh, i'm pretty sure the book uh the book and the film is called The Enigma. So the cryptographer whose work played a decisive role in the breaking of the Enigma code, this increase in prosecution called into question the legal system in place for dealing with homosexual acts. In the book of the film, Alan Turing uh, is, like I said, he's a, he's, he's a gay man. And it also touches on the treatment that he underwent in order to become straight. So it, it does touch on that a little bit. The report of the Departmental Committee on Homosexual Offences and Prostitution, better known as the Wolf Enden Report, was published in 1953, three years after the committee first met in September 1954. It was commissioned in response to evidence that homosexuality could not legitimately be regarded as a disease and aimed to bring about charge in the current law by making recommendations to the government. Central to the report findings was that the state should focus on protecting the public rather than scrutinising people's private lives. Exactly, like who cares? If you've watched my previous video, which is Are We Born Gay? I'll, I'll link it up there if you if you haven't watched it. Go watch it after you've watched this one. At that point, they think that being gay is a disease and being in love with someone of the same sex is a disease, which it isn't. It took 10 years for the government to implement the Wolf Enden report recommendations in the Sexual Offences Act 1967. Backed by the Church of England and the House of Lords, the Sexual Offences Act partly legalised same-sex acts in the UK between men over the age of 21, conducted in private. Scotland and Northern Ireland followed suit over a decade later in 1980 and 1981 respectively. Sexual Offences Act represented a stepping stone towards quality but there was still a long way to go. If you were over the age of 21 and you were male you could engage in being open but in private. Again like at this point it just it very little on the lesbian side of things and the female side of things. It's just a little bit on the gender side of things but at the minute it's mainly just females. In 1966 the Beaumont Society was set up to provide information and education to the general public. Medical and legal professions on transvestism and encourage research aimed to a fuller understanding. The organisation is now the UK's largest and longest running support group of transgender people and their families. In the wake of the Stonewall Rise in New York in June 1969, if you haven't watched my very first Alphabet Mafia questions answered video, please go watch that because that touches on Stonewall Rise if you don't know what they are. 
I highly recommend go watching that. Over the treatment of the LGBT community by the police in the UK, Gay Liberation Front was founded in 1970. GLF fought for rights of the LGBT people, urging them to question the mainstream institutions in the UK society which led to their oppression. The GLF protested in solidarity with other opposed groups and organised the very first Pride March in 1972, which is now an annual event. So that kind of kick-started the UK's Pride, I guess, because Stonewall wasn't, like, it didn't happen in the UK, so we were a little bit further behind. But yeah, pretty much, like, maybe around about the same time uh, the Stonewall riots happened. It might have been literally just a handful of years, but eventually we did have a Pride, um, and, like, Stonewall kind of plays into why we have a Pride. When the GLF disbanded in late 1973, the campaign for homosexual equality based in Manchester led the fight for equality by legal reform. Age of consent equality, however, did not come until 2001 in England, Scotland and Wales and 2009 in Northern Ireland. The fight for sexual equality, however, was far from over. Section 28 of the Legal Government Act 1988, introduced by the Conservative Government under Margaret Thatcher, banned local authorities from promoting homosexuality or pretended family relationships and prohibited council from funding educational materials and projects perceived to promote homosexuality. So essentially, that got stopped when Margaret Thatcher came into power. The legalisation prevented the discussion of LGBT issues and stopped pupils getting the support they needed. Section 28 was repealed in 2003 and the Prime Minister David Cameron apologised for the legalisation in 2009. That to me tells me that it was literally about whoever was the Prime Minister at the time, it was based on their opinion. In 2004, the Civil Partnership Act of 2004 allowed same-sex couples to legally enter into binding partnerships, similar to marriage. So basically, the civil partnership wasn't technically a marriage, but it was something similar. And I'm pretty sure they didn't have all the rights as someone who was male and female in a marriage. Um, and I'm pretty sure today, even though it is classed as a marriage by law, if you have kids, one parent has full, like, full legal rights, whereas the other one has to adopt that child even though even though it's two people in a loving relationship and a loving marriage only one parent has full rights and the other has to adopt personally i believe that you know if you're a female married or a female if you're a male married or a male both parents should have the exact same right over that child and it shouldn't just be one one person that has rights because if it, if it's male and female you both have equal rights but i'm pretty sure today you know if i was married and i had kids only one of us would have rights so the subsequent marriage same-sex couples act in 2013 then went further allowing same-sex couples in england and wales to marry and that happened in 2014 so in 2014 in this country it was legal for me to get married to someone that I love. That wasn't too long ago, We're only in 2021 now. The Gender Recognisation uh, Act of 2004 which came in effect in the 4th of April 2005 gave trans people full legal recogn recognition of their gender allowing them to acquire a new birth certificate although gender options are limited to male or female. Between July and October 2018 the UK government consulted the public on reforming the act as of the 1st of September 2020 no report from consultation has been published so that was a brief history even though it was a long history again that touched on a little bit of the transgender community personally I think we need to be a little bit more supportive and inclusive of the T and LGBT Q plus and like even like I know people who identify as lesbians and they don't treat someone who identifies as bisexual with that much respect at all just because they're into men as well as women we need to like we say that we're an inclusive community but yet in, within our community some people are not inclusive and they they have a very low tolerance for someone who doesn't identify as the same uh, sexuality as them. So let's touch a little bit on transgender laws in the UK. It's just kind of, I'm just going to go into a little bit more detail about it. So the Gender Recognition Act of 2004 allows people to gain full recognition of their acquired gender. Um, this legal recognition enables people to obtain a new birth certificate that shows their acquired gender, enabling them to adopt almost all of the legal rights which are afforded to that sex. So that right there tells me that we are still very, very 
very sexist in this country. So that tells me if you are female and you transition transition into a male, you get more rights than you would if you had stayed female. If you are a male and you transitioned into a female, you basically lose some of the rights that you had as a male. If that doesn't tell you anything, I don't know what will. Um, we are still very sexist when it comes to a whole lot of things, uh, including equal marriage rights. However, the law continues to allow sports organisations to exclude transsexual people from certain sporting competitions if they have evidence that the participation of that person would put other competitors at risk or impact on the principles of fair competition. That's fucked up. Name one person who identifies as transgender and plays sports. Our it. You can't name one off the top of your head. Um, if you can, please let me know down below and I'll do a little bit of research on that person. Um, but I can't think of anyone who identifies as transgender that plays sport or like a, is a professional sport um, at a professional level. I can't think of anyone at the top of my head and we need more representation in the media of people who are transgender because we, you know, we're only just seeing now seeing people of the same sex and you know, same-sex couples and same-sex couples having kids and stuff like that. Like, we're only just say, seeing stuff like that becoming normal in, like, normal on shows and, and films and stuff like that, whereas we have a long way to go. When it comes to the transgender side of things, um, if you've ever watched Sense8, um, there is a transgender actor in there. That is pretty much the only transgender actor that I'm aware of. And I didn't even know she was transgender at first. Um, I didn't even know she was transgender at first. As soon as I found that out, I was like, oh, like, yes, like, good for you. Um, we need more representation like that in everyday life. Um, if you want to go into a little bit more detail with transgender laws, um, I will link that website down below. I have about uh, two or four. I've got five websites open at the minute. If you want to have a little look see yourself, please do so. I encourage you to research on things that you don't know and educate yourself, which is what this series is all about, educating people. If you like this video, please give it a like. If you have any of the questions that you want me to answer in the Alphabet Mafia series, please let me know down below in the comments. Um, if you want to subscribe, Please subscribe, no pressure on that one. But other than that, hopefully we've learned a few things today and I will see you in the next one.